futile because we know obviously we're not reclamation, we're depending on successful vegetation establishment, and that's really challenging in drought conditions. And so we have three people on our panel that are going to come up and share some of their experiences, some things they tweaked over during their experiences during drought, and we'll have a, hopefully have a good discussion about that. Um, and we will have mics going around so you guys can ask some questions, share some of your experience as well. So I'm going to be moderating the drought. Um, Miranda Meehan, I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist at NDSU Extension, as well as our Disaster Education Coordinator. So this past year, my life was drought. Um, and I have my master's, my undergrad in animal range science, PhD in natural resource management. But I have 30 years of experience doing Western reclamation. Uh, before that, I spent my first 28 years of my life on a dairy farm. So I've pretty much been putting seed in the ground all my life. Um, when I when I moved out west and and uh, got hooked up in the reclamation business, um, we did a lot of different things to try and maximize uh, what you can get out of your uh, getting that seed in the ground and getting your production. Um, 15 years, I worked for a reclamation company out of Laramie, Wyoming, and I traveled all the Rocky Mountain region uh, doing seeding at almost sea level, all the way up to 11,000 feet, and then uh, uh, from the Canadian border down to the Mexican border. So it, I've been through quite a, a variety of different ecological systems and figured kind of figured out a lot of things and drought is one of the hardest things to to figure out and and get a handle on so hopefully i can share today some of our some of the things that i've done in the, in the past hello everyone my name is george hovers uh, i work for mplx i am our environmental coordinator for the west um, so we got eight states we operate in west of the Mississippi, you know, from North Dakota to Texas, from Oklahoma to Utah. Um, and we're all kind of in the same boat. It's been <laughs> drought for the past couple of years for all those states. Um, on the other hand, our eastern states have been a surplus of precipitation, but we've been working through many of the same problems as everyone else has, um, trying to figure out what to do, when to do. Um, my background, um, I come from West Virginia. Um, <laughs> Have a master's degree in civil engineering with a focus in, in hydrology. Um, did master's research in reclamation, um, CD emulsion techniques, what affects our vegetation growth, um, what limits our vegetation, and how to improve our percentages and time frames. Um, but yep, new, need experiences. Feel free to ask tons of questions. And as Brad said, my name is Craig Petrick. I was the uh, late one getting my bio in, so just to give you a quick, uh, the last four years working with B and I Cole doing reclamation uh, here in the state as their reclamation specialist. And prior to that, I uh, spent about six years doing some remediation work in West North Dakota for some working with some oil and gas companies. Um, as these guys said, you guys, we, we went through the drought this last year. We're hoping to share a few experiences that we had. So. Um, I'll start with our first question and we'll I mean, we have a few questions and just kind of get the conversation rolling and then we'll hand it over and open up for questions from everyone. So mm -hmm. we know reclamation is difficult in our climate regardless since we're in a semi-arid climate, moisture is limiting, it's it's a challenge to start with and when we're in a drought we it's a, that increases that challenge. Um, could you guys describe some of the drought related challenges you've had on some of your reclamation projects? Yeah I'll just start here in a little pass it down the line, but uh, you know, one, one of our big things when, when we're doing large scale reclamation of, uh, if I was just putting some numbers together, we're disturbing typically um, 400 acres a year and then reclaiming 300 behind it is kind of what we're doing. So um, on a yearly basis, you know, erosion control is one of the first things that comes to mind with us because we're reclaiming a lot of native native range sites. So we're, we're, there's pretty good topography through there. So we're trying not to have any loss of uh, our soil resources through all that. Um, and then start getting uh, vegetation established because where we operate our mine at is in a pretty uh, private private land ownership. So trying to get land then turned back over to producers so they can start utilizing it. Um, 
you know, a couple of the, this, this last year, um, so the year before we had a lot of moisture early on, if everybody remembered um, from the previous fall, it was super wet. It was like one of the historically probably wettest, like September's and October's. So two years ago, we kind of scraped by, even though there was a drought, uh, but then coming in this next year, we, we could see it already, um, what we're gonna have to deal with. So uh, a lot of the reclamation that we did, we do is uh, have, have to build a plan for it. Uh, so a couple steps that we took was we, we, we've got a lot of stuff graded, ready to go, that it was prepped for seed in that prior fall, decided let's not seed it, let's just stabilize it, whether it's using a mulch, a hydro mulch, something like that. So we're, we're, we're mitigating our erosion control and also trying to then mitigate any more about that evaporative loss. Um, when that spring came around, um, we just kept prepping soil rather than going in and actually doing it. We, we actually delayed reclamation basically kind of uh, wait, waiting for a, a more opportune time. Um, there were some sites that we tried to put low cost inputs in, you know, maybe putting an old crop in or something, even though we knew there was a final, a final seeding of a native seed or something like that. But instead of burning our, our higher inputs on that when it had less chance, let's wait for a rain. So um, we did a lot of delayed stuff. Um, also then trying to, we did some supplemental seedings on some other tracks then too, just to help hold with some establishment. But, um, having having seed beds prepped and then also just doing some sort of stabilizing agent was a big, big win for us last year actually. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Alan indicated, we did get some moisture then in July, um, so it, it worked out for us that we did some later seeding. That's not applicable for producers because, um, as he said, if we if I was a farmer and had four thousand acres, I couldn't wait till July to seed. Uh, in our in our case, uh, dealing with starting over reclamation, that was something we could do. So. I'll keep passing the mic down here and let Paul talk a little bit too. Thank you. I got one word to say. Ditto. <laughs> um, in reclamation, you know, you're trying to get natives established, so you're not um, working with production on, on crops, but he, I pretty much could say <laughs> word for word what he just said. Um, but I will say this. At NARM, we really watch the local events. So I'll just give you one quick example. Um, this last year started out really dry. I did my seeding. Uh, NARM is pretty much a spring seeding for best results. Uh, we can do some fall seeding, but doesn't we don't get the good results. Um, we started out really, really slow in the spring, and I was pretty much had given up on, on what I put in the ground. And by the middle of July, we ended up starting to turn the faucet on, and it came and it came and it came and it came. And I was very, very fortunate to be able to have some good warm season species planted and those warm season species really took off with that monsoonal rain that showed up. Um, we had some blue grandma that, that just, I was amazed we had seed heads that were this big, but I'm not gonna say that happens all the time, every time. It's a big crapshoot. And what happens at NARM is not gonna happen here in North Dakota. So, what I try to do is really watch those local events in the, in the springtime. If I see a snowstorm coming and back to the, to getting that uh, tillage done early, get that tillage done. So when it's time to put the seed in the ground, get it, get that seed in the ground to utilize that moisture that mother nature gives us. Cause we don't always know when we're going to get it. Thank you. Pretty much the same thing these guys both said. Um, but in addition to that, we've been really focusing this past year with our contractors, our internal folks, and our inspectors at honing in our reclamation techniques and practices. Um, we know the major factors that affect it, just like the last presentation mentioned. You want to get that water down into the soil profile. You don't want it running off into you. It's vital. We need to capture it. So we've been looking at, are we making sure that our sites aren't over compacted? If they are, are we going through and disking that, making that prepped and ready to absorb as much moisture as possible when we get it. And when we do get it, making sure we try to keep it in there as long as possible. 
uh, making sure we have a good mulch base over top. As the sun beats down and the wind blows, that it's not taking that moisture out away from us instead of getting that vital initial root growth from the vegetation that's going to be there long term to sustain us. Um, last year was tricky, as we all know. We had some projects that we got really lucky. Construction completed. We got it reclaimed. At the same time, we got it reclaimed, seed and mulch. We got rain. We got the initial cover crop established, and then our perennials are starting to establish. But that was a rarity last year. That's only a handful of projects. Most of our projects still look like we finished up last year. We seeded and mulched, but nothing's really popped. So anticipating that, this spring we're hoping to watch the weather very closely, um, try to time it with our contractors to get out there and reed seed right before or immediately after that we get that precipitation. So we can get that initial growth and try to get some time to type of establishment. Um, in addition to getting that establishment started, we're really hoping that with making sure we're not over compacted in our right of ways, that the moisture is staying deeper down the profile. That way when the roots do establish and get deeper, they'll start feeding off of the moisture lower in the profile um, and hopefully support them through the summer months and fall uh, with the goal to try to meet our 70% vegetation cover. But uh, as we all know, it's been really tricky. And the reality is that we're spending a lot of money to go back out and reseed, remulch, um, try to look at other techniques to use. Um, and it, it is challenging. Uh, one of the products we've been looking at and using in other states, um, not quite yet in North Dakota, is uh, biotic soil medias um, like biotic earth and proganics. Uh, we've been noticing one of the big factors outside of moisture that's affecting our growth is organic matter. And we also know organic matter helps retain that moisture. If you don't have it, which is a case for a lot of disturbed sites, um, we're looking into what's the cost analysis of putting that product down and getting us outside of our permits, getting the vegetation and closing the project out. So far initially it's showing that using those products is helping us um, and it's a lot more cost competitive than hauling in topsoil for sites that are barren. That's another option we've been trying to use to help keep the moisture there to get that sustained growth. So You're right. We'll get the next one. One of the things that we do a lot when we're working with farmers and ranchers is we encourage them to have a, a drought plan with well-defined triggers um, and trigger dates for making decisions. Is, is that something that you guys have as part of your planning when in the reclamation process? And if so, could you talk about that a little? Currently, that's not something in our plan right now, but we're working towards it. Um, as I said, we're trying to reevaluate as a company our basic methods and uh, working forward as a company, we're reevaluating all those base items uh, to see what we should start looking at and start doing for future projects. So our precip zone at NARM is a lot uh, lower than it is here. Um, on an average year, we get about 10 inches. So we're, we try to um, do everything that we can based on drought seeding. So if we end up with some good moisture years, it'll benefit us uh, immensely that way. But as far as triggers go, we really don't have a big trigger mechanism. Um, I I look at uh, El Nino and La Nino, La Nina effects. Um, look at I look at that and have been on site there at NARM 30 years, so I kind of know what happens when those two systems are working. And so I kind of try to plan that way, but I really don't have uh, a big trigger or a big light bulb that goes off to, to try and work with uh, drought conditions. So kind of maybe expanding a hair on it, uh, you know, same thing, we pretty anecdotal of what we're, what we're doing for the seeding, but you know, we do work pretty hand in hand with landowners and tenants out there uh, that utilizing these reclaimed lands. And again, a lot of it is um, hayland or, uh, or native grassland for grazing. So we do have, uh, 
have the producers file grazing plans with us, so that, that outlines some of that, and that has been helpful. Um, but more than anything, what it's identified to us is we've done some supplemental, maybe not supplemental is the right word, we've changed the way we did grazing rather than 160 acre paddocks. We, we This last year, we increased our fencing dramatically to do smaller paddocks at a time so they could do more movement throughout. Um, I think that helped actually some of the grass last longer for, for our tenants, so by being able to utilize some of that. Um, the other point, we typically, when we do reclaim something, we usually keep producers out for at least minimum two years, more likely three years. Um, tried to stick to that pretty hard, even through this drought condition this last year on some of those tracks that we'd like to give them a little more free time away from cattle before we start bringing them in. But uh, that, that's another thing we really evaluated this last year. So. You guys have all touched on this a little, but are there any specific tools or resources that you use to make drought related management decisions? You know, some of it, like I said, is the moisture. I, I wouldn't say we have a, a definite tool there, you know, going off some of the grazing plans by using, uh, I'll say, Wing Young and RCS quite a bit for some of that of how, how we should be out applying some of that stuff, but also just with our proper water management then for helping out uh, producers with where, where we can get water and where we can't and then also do with just more rotational. Um, I think that's been a big uptick, so. Yeah, a lot of times I look at uh, species that are in my permit that I can use as substitute species uh, for a, a more droughtier year. Um, we have some shrub standards that we have to meet down there in the basin because of wildlife. And sometimes that's uh, indicative of, of how that works too. Um, the shrubs don't like the cool season grasses. Uh, too much competition there for, for the minimal moisture. So sometimes we change things around a little bit and, and bump our, our shrub areas up uh, to try and uh, maximize what little moisture we get down there. So those are just a few management tools that we try to do. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of times it depends on your project completes. Um, sometimes we get fortunate it's right at the time we're getting moisture and other times we're in the dead of the summer and you plant but then it fails. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we're reusing products like Perganics, Biotic Earth, kind of aid in topsoil development on areas that are lacking, try to hold that extra moisture, make sure we're breaking up that soil profile, um, not having over compact soil so the, the soil absorbs it. Um, outside of that, we try to follow DOT and NRCS recommendations on seed types and recommendations and timeframes. Um, some states we look into specific seed mixes um, that are a little more drought tolerant um, based on some recommendations from the NRCS. Um, but here in North Dakota, we've strictly been sticking what's been typically used, um, but mainly focusing on getting back down to the basic techniques that we know that we need to do during reclamation. Um, prepping the soil, saving the topsoil, um, putting it back in sequence. Um, we did have a lot of fall projects that we ended up deciding to not seed and just put a cover crop down um, in addition to mulch just because we knew that time of the year, we didn't have enough time to get stuff established. Um, so then this spring, just looking at trying to time it appropriately when we see some moisture coming along, to put that permanent seed mix down um, and trying to put it at an application rate that we see might be fit. A lot of projects last year, we used a, a variety of reclamation techniques, um, anywhere from different seed spacings to different types of mulches. Um, and we're really hoping to see this year if any of those are going to help us um, to get us a longer sustainable vegetation growth. Um, but we're kind of in the experimental stage as everyone else through the drought, just trying to figure out what's going to work or use some techniques that have been tried in other places. So, yeah, it sounds like a lot of you, you're all using some of the climate data to direct your decisions and and I think out of the box of how we can use that information to, to adjust your management. And you, you guys have all touched on this, but when we're in the middle of a drought, we're gonna, we're forced to think of outside the box. Um, and you know, can you expand on how you adapted your reclamation process 
practices in response during the drought and, and any describe any adaptions that you guys made and which ones you found successful so far? So on the success side, we're, we're hoping to evaluate that this year based on what we tried this past year. Um, outside of what I've, I've already mentioned, we haven't done anything different than that. Um, we're looking out to other options, other products out there. As we all know, the industry is really changing. There's a lot of different products available now. Um, there's a few products on the market that we've been evaluating in some other states. Um, it's basically a dry pellet that you would mix into your topsoil that could potentially absorb extra moisture when you initially see um, and spray the hydro mulch down. It's possibly trying to use that long term to keep moisture longer in the soil profile. Um, there's estimates that could stay in there and keep that moisture available to the root systems for an extra six to eight months. Um, we haven't tried that up here yet. We're just kind of experimenting um, to see if that helps in some of the uh, arid regions down south, um, but outside of that, no. So I guess I would start by saying we changed some management practices um, from topsoil laydown to tillage procedures and tillage equipment. Um, following that ground to try and let that moisture get in deeper into the soils, uh, leaving, doing deep ripping and leaving it really undulated so that moisture can get into the, to the sponge of the earth um, and, let, and let the earth be your best reservoir. So then after tillage, um, I worked a little bit with changing seed mixes um, using more droughty species within our permitting, uh, available permitting species. And then um, uh, managing some grazing procedures too, like uh, and we've talked up here, but those, those things you have to kind of look at um, throughout your experiences. And, and like I have said before, it's, it's a little bit different down where I'm at. So there's, there's years that we're in that five inches of precip a year, including snow. So that's pretty light for trying to get anything really much to grow. The other thing that I've always listened to and practiced is with native reclamation, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. So what does that tell you? That tells you you gotta have some patience. Now, as a, as a somebody that talking about native rangeland, that's a little easier to say than somebody out there trying to produce some hay or some corn. To get those crops, you cannot have that kind of patience. I'm pretty fortunate in that rangeland reclamation side. I can, I can have that patience as long as I can get things stabilized. I like that point, Paul, because I'll say that I'm learning to have to learn that because I'm not a patient person, but uh, I am seeing that also. Um, I'm not going to do the reclamation things that I want to kind of bring up here of techniques that we've really been implementing by B and I the last couple of years, maybe aren't directly related to the drought that we've been experiencing last year, but more, hey, let's try to, we know it's gonna, the drought's eventually gonna come, so let's do a few things. And you know, some of it was, we were trying to introduce um, cattle, more cattle to our reclamation sites, whether they're agricultural, um, you know, trying to do fall grazing after, uh, after a cover crop seeding of a wheat crop or something like that, or even just, you know, more rotational grazing on, on historical native lands. Just looking to try to build our soil profile. Um, so when we do have moisture, we can retain more of it. Um, keeping vegetation on anything we can at all times of the year, how, however long it is. Uh, we, we do a lot of a lot of fall seeding um, with either a wheat or um, some of the brassica, something like that. That new growth we think we're getting off of that. We're going to help retain some soil moisture in the long run, even though it's using some up at that point in time. Also, it's been, again, trying to build that soil column so we have more in reserve for when something happens, because uh, I don't think this trend of drought is probably going to go away. Um, 
so try to be pre preemptive on some of that. You know, that, that is alluding to some more longer term things. You know, I know some of the disturbances that uh, you're dealing with over there, linear pipeline stuff that not quite apply, but we're looking at a little bit larger scale equations here. But uh, I think some of those principles apply of trying to be proactive that it, it might be a few years, so it, it's it's not a it's not a quick quick turn on these processes. You gotta build up to it slowly through a few of those other adaptations. Thanks for sharing. I'm gonna open up to questions and just raise your hand and we'll make sure to run a mic around so that everyone can hear you. So I think indirectly you guys might have talked about this, but can you talk specifically more towards wind and trying to minimize wind effects and maybe in that same vein, how do you catch more snow too? Paul, I'm sure Paul has some intakes on this too, but for, for wind, our big thing is trying not to ever have just bare earth there. Uh, well, once we get to the point that we have all our topsoil down and we started doing some working on it, we got to get it covered. Even if we aren't seeding right away, we, we got to get it covered with some sort of mulch like that to try to mitigate that. As for putting in wind bricks for uh, catching, catching snow, something we haven't done. I'll say that's something we haven't even chased or evaluated at this point in time. So. So in our mine plan, we're pretty fortunate that uh, we have to put back the, the, the post mine topography to the original uh, contour, approximate original contour. So we have a lot of rough breaks where our mine is. So that means we can leave some pretty good topography. We can set up uh, some good snow drifting areas within our PMT, um, we build wildlife habitat, which basically amounts to rock piles for the, for the bunny rabbits to live in. But those rock piles are also great snow catchers, snow fences, um, works well. Uh, the other thing too that uh, you gotta work with is not always can you have some good vegetative cover to help with with Brenda's question about wind. And so once we strip topsoil off, those pre-strip benches are pretty prone to drifting from wind. And so what we do is we try to go in and use some 1930s management practices and we rip that ground up to slow that wind down to catch moisture to catch fugitive dust. And I can also transfer some of that into my topsoil uh, laydowns by doing the same thing, rip it on the contour, um, minimize what that wind does to that soil to try and, and maximize keeping moisture in the ground. So that's some of those things. Can't speak to any snow uh, capture. Um, our projects are just linear projects, 100 foot wide, or uh, compressor sites, or something like that. It's a few acres. Um, but on management of the soil through the construction process and trying to figure out our wind disturbances and that kind of stuff, we just try to make sure our projects are put back and reclaimed as fast as possible. Um, and as most of us know, with linear projects, you can move pretty quick from the day you topsoil windrow and then, top, and then uh, windrow your subsoil. Um, typically, we'll either windrow them both on the same side of the right of way or have the windrows on opposite sides of the right of way. Um, we notice that the windrows themselves tend to not get too badly disturbed by the wind, um, but our travel lanes that are getting beat to death, dried up, is what really picks up and wants to blow away. So by using our windrows, really helps that soil from being blown away, but then getting it put back as quick as possible. So most of these problems, we're trying to get everything open cut, put back within a month's time frame generally. So we don't have the same problems necessarily as, as bigger sites, but we do try to consider it. Other questions? Who do you use for, I'll get it for Okay. Who do you use for your soil test? What labs do you go to or do your soil test? Um, we 
we typically follow our landowner agreements. Um, most times we're not getting soil tests done. Um, we're just preserving the top layers, try to put them back. We see vegetation issues generally in our contracts. Um, we uh, put it onto our contract peers to follow up with vegetation failures. Um, if we have a failure after the first year, a lot of times they'll send it um, to a soil lab, but I'm not sure what lab they're sending it to. Yeah. I would uh, pretty much mimic exactly what he said. Um, we have to sample our subsoils, our uh, overburdened soils to meet parameters, but our topsoils we don't sample and in native reclamation in Wyoming, fertilizer is not, not your friend. Fertilizer makes all the weeds grow. So that's competition for that intense moisture competition. You know, they're, they're, those weeds are way more aggressive than the native ground is. So we're not really too concerned with uh, soil nutrients and, and makeup and composition, but we're more concerned with if we have a failure area, then we'll go test and see what maybe what our issues are, um, salinity, salts, things of that nature. So. Yeah, we started sampling a little bit more for nutrients um, in the last couple of years. I'll say the, the lab we use ours is a bite this year right here in the state. But, um, yeah, so we started doing a little bit more. Still, we do not put on, I'll say, same level of uh, fertilizer and nutrients as I would if I was trying to grow a 50 bushel wheat crop or something like that. But um, we, we do evaluate it nowadays. I do work for NRCS, and so this question is um, kind of targeted for Greg, <laughs> you said, um, or at least I heard that you, if there's an opportunity for seeding grass, possibly outside of a grass seeding window, because we have specific windows for our programs, but if there's an opportunity to plant, you take that opportunity yeah yeah we're um we really target like i said like this last year i'll say i didn't put any native seed in the ground until after july this last year uh, it, we just delayed it we put cover crops in to start out with we made sure our sites were stabilized but we we, we went away from that higher input of a native grass seed it's one of our highest inputs that we can have proceeded delayed it until we thought conditions were were right based on what the climatic conditions were I have a question um, in terms of some of the more, more traditional reclamation processes that you might use. I know everyone mentioned hydro mulch, for example. Is there a point that during a drought that some of those practices maybe not aren't appropriate, they do more harm than they do good? You guys want to go? <laughs> I would say, <clears throat> I know everybody's talked about cover crops here and, and those things. When I was probably early 2000s at NARM, we sat down and talked about cover crops. And we talked about the amount of moisture that was used by those cover crops. Now that's, that's their whole purpose in life is to suck the moisture and nutrition out of the ground and make big seed. You know, that's a cover crop, a grain. You know, it wants to make, it wants to survive. So it's going to take all that stuff out of the ground. So what we did is through our permit, we had to change a little bit of things in our permit and get it approved, but we basically took away using a cover crop to not use that precious moisture out of the soil. 
I'm not saying I, I don't like the organic that the cover crops give you in that soil. So in, our, in a couple of, those of my seed mixes, uh, one of them I use a real low rate of, uh, of barley cover crop for uh, stabilization, quick stabilization on, on slopier areas. But instead of going in and planting 30 pounds or 60 pounds of, of barley the year before and letting that, you know, suck that moisture up and try and, and utilize and get some organics out of it, we changed that process around. I'm now using the brassicas we've mentioned here. Um, those give you a lot more below surface organics than they do above surface biomass. So it basically is keeping, when it's growing and using that moisture, it's keeping that moisture below the surface and adding storage. And it's also adding organics, breaking soils up, making it so you have better percolation and infiltration of the moisture that you do get. So, um, you kind of adapt and change and, and make things work to, uh, to help your process. So. Comparing hydromulch to say typical straw mulch, um, I can't say we've seen a difference in say moisture content or something like that. Um, the bigger difference we notice is, is how do you restore that soil surface? Is it smooth like your yard or are you leaving it furrowed and rough? Um, you know, you want to leave it rough. For these these reclamation sites you want that water to absorb wind you don't want it to sheet off um, so we we've been working with our contractors to not make that a smooth surface leave the cleat marks up and down the slopes leave your furrow marks leave your drill seeding marks that way when we do get a little bit of moisture whether it's from rain snow or dew in the morning um, that's going to have little micro zones where that's going to help soak in it's really all i have on that front You guys are a quiet group this morning. <laughs> I can do a second question. On the soil side of things, um, some textures are going to be naturally uh, droughty. So how do you deal with different soil textures um, that might be enhanced under major climate drought? And then maybe more for the linear uh, uh, situations, how do you deal with that? Because you see so many different textures as you go across the landscape. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it is difficult because uh, in one length of the project, you could have dozens of different soil types. Um, our goal is to try to increase the organic matter. Um, we know it's going to hold a little bit more moisture um, towards the root zone of that plant. Um, we get into sites that are from clay bentonite to nice loamy soils that kind of hold the moisture a little more to straight sand. Um, and the best thing we found um, throughout the different regions we operate in is getting that organic matter, getting a good overrising. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very expensive to haul in topsoil. Um, so that's why we look into alternatives like the organic and biotic earth um, to get that overrising started, um, kind of hold the moisture there initially. But ultimately, it can only hold moisture so long. If it stays prolonged drought, it's going to evaporate out of that as well. Um, but that's what we've been doing. Um, maybe these guys can uh, elaborate a little more. <laughs> My situation's quite a bit different than his. A lot of times, it deals with we deal with uh, what the topsoil pile makeup is some of the structure within that topsoil pile. If we're, if we're using topsoil out of a storage pile, uh, some of the direct hauls that we do where we're stripping and then laying back down, um, we've got a little better handle on, on some of those things. And we can adjust what seed mixes we put in where. Uh, we're basically given, in our permit, we're given 
um, areas that say what the post mine veg will be, um, but within those regions, uh, whether grassland or our shrubland, we can change our mixes around a little bit. And so then we can adapt what the mixes are to what the soils are to get the best results. Yeah, just maybe Paul's kind of touched on it at the end that I'd say my, my biggest comment is we, we've tried to start targeting our actually seeding a little bit more specific on the different soil types, even when you're looking at larger blocks, there's, there's some differences throughout there. You know, we have um, proof seed mixes that are permitted. We changed them throughout the years here and there, um, but we have started looking at it some, and I'll say it's more on the back end. We, we kind of have a generic still that we've been really looking for the, the first time out. Um, going down those next couple of years now, we've been saying, okay, this is an area that Forbes are going to do better in. Let's target seed right there. And, telling it somewhat based on what we're seeing as vegetation and then kind of correlating that to the, the, the soil type. So I'm um, trying to hit a little bit broad, but then also then in the subsequent years doing more targeted based and stuff. So. so all your reclamation activities have a certain amount of regulation to them, whether it's the, the coal mine reclamation or following the erosion uh, settlement control permits. Um, can you give some examples where those regulations work at cross purposes with the goal of establishing that vegetation? Voting question, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to say, uh, I don't know if Ryan's in the room yet, but uh, uh, Ryan's going to touch on some stuff this afternoon and one of the breakouts of uh, a few <laughs> things that was done out at our mine and a couple other mines here of just looking at. Um, different ways to lay down um, first your overburden and then your subsoil and your topsoil. I, I don't think the, the things that are done there are so outrageously different than what we're actually permitted for, but I think there's maybe some potential changes that can come out of that. So um, I'm not going to um, spoil that part of what Ryan's going to tell us about later. So I'll, I'll let that be. But I, I'll say that's maybe one of the, the bigger, bigger spots where I can see maybe some possible constraints is just. Um, we, we talked about roughing stuff off a little more a few times and some of our regulations come more to kind of try to smooth stuff off. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I will try not to insult him. <laughs> um, being a practitioner, you know what you can do on the ground. And you know what it takes to get that done. Um, sometimes you have to stick to that and prove your point and have a good argument for why you want change or have the facts to back up what you're trying to change within the regulatory. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't really have any comments on my end. Our projects are just open so short a time frame. We don't really run into bigger issues. Let's do a mining side. I think we'll probably just wrap up. Thank you all for your. Oh, we have one more question. Uh, George, on your uh, organic material you're adding, um, how are you guys applying that? And are you guys targeting just the surface or are you working it in at all? Very good question. Depends where we're at, um, what kind of uh, land class we're on, and uh, what regulatory restraints may or may not be, or landowner restraints. Um, most often, just simply from a hydro seeding machine, um, applying it at about a quarter inch thick. Um, and then, uh, obviously, of course, making our topsoil layers back back to original. Um, but we find if you have less than 2% organic matter, your vegetation really suffers. So that's what's been driving us to try to boost that. Um, and then we all know with outcoming studies and information that your uh, the bio life in that soil is very important. Um, and you know, if you stack that soil for too long, that life can uh, be affected. So uh, 
we have projects in different states where we have to have our pipelines open for six to 12 months for say long wall mining underneath or something. Um, on those, we especially come back and put that buyer media in. Um, otherwise, we find ourselves waiting twice as long to get that regrowth because everything in that topsoil pile just is kind of suffocated out. Um, we have had areas due to regulations and permitting that we need to close our permit out. We're so close, but we got patches that just are not vegetating. Um, sun's beating down on it. It's frying it up. There's not a lot of organic matter in it. It's not holding a lot of moisture. So we've actually went in back, back by hand and spread those products um, and try to break that crusted material up, work a little bit down into that soil profile trying to keep it from getting so compacted again, um, especially sites that are pretty heavy in clay. And then uh, taking backpacks of water in and trying to hydrate that because you don't have a big hydro either. Um, and getting those last few spots to close out for the permit. That's been working very well for us um, as touch up methods, which is a little different. Um, and then we have some places where we're spraying it by helicopters. <laughs> Um, which has been working pretty effectively, especially time-wise where you can't get equipment into some rougher terrain. Um, but uh, so far it's helping us. Um, it's closing our permits out sooner. Um, as mentioned, if you got a native mix, you're waiting a little longer than normal. Um, you just have to anticipate that. But putting that product down, we notice our cover crop stays healthier. When it dies back off, any nutrients that it took up is being put back in that soil, breaking down, starting that overrise, and, um, and kind of getting some of that uh, bio life back to processes. So when that native seed is kicking up, there's some stuff there to help the root systems. It, it was touched on earlier regarding the usefulness of, of soil health analysis or sampling. Would would there be any resources that either the panel or anybody else would want that, that could help or or provide uh, just an outline of what would be kind of the critical analyses or parameters that that could be helpful if if the uh, uh, soil health analysis was was actually something that NRCS. Yeah, NRCS. Yeah, NRCS. Yeah. So, yeah, kind of these guys are whispering. Uh, same thing I use is the NRCS. There's a lot of good information out on their website. Um, but through my experience and studies and projects, um, the biggest factors that we notice that affect is your pH, um, your organic matter, um, and then uh, sometimes your salt levels. It depends where you're at and if that's in your soil. Um, outside of that, we haven't noticed anything that's directly correlated, affected the vegetation as severe. Um, so we focus on those two primarily. Yeah. If you're storing topsoils long term, say one or two years and longer, is there a certain height to your piles that you try to minimize so you don't, to avoid sterilization? <laughs> about 35 or 40 year old topsoil piles. We have some of those. Um, our permit says our piles can't be higher than 50 feet, but you don't want to make a three foot or a four foot tall pile in our instance to have the same capacity that you would of a 50 foot tall pile. That's a big footprint that you're covering with a three foot versus a 50 foot. So I mentioned brassicas before, and I'm a big proponent, seeing what they've done in the last five years for us, I'm a big proponent of using those species in those older decadent topsoil piles. Now the University of Wyoming has done a lot, a lot of studies on older topsoil piles and uh, newer topsoil piles. They've really kind of um, beat that horse. But in Wyoming, we're finding that 
some of the results out of a 30 year old pile versus a two year old pile can be the same because we have good wind down there. And the wind's gonna pull all that microorganisms and fungi and all of that. And it's gonna blow in the wind and, and get that soil back alive after it's set for a long time. Um, those of that group at, at the university, that's one of their main conclusions on that was uh, if you've got good wind, you're gonna have native inoculation uh, into that topsoil. So um, I know there was a big push at times to, to have sh shorter, less uh, dense topsoil piles, but I think um, we have pretty good success both ways. Paul's probably had a little more experience on that one than me, but uh, I'll say one of the things you and I hear before we end here is uh, we started slowly some of our bigger historical piles, slowly been uh, trying to carve into them, um, not trying to do the whole thing at once. Um, so we're taking some levels, so then you're trying to get, get some extra, and then we go in and reseed the, the disturbance that's left whenever we do go into a pile. If you don't take the whole thing, then we're going to seeding into it again. Um, we do have some bigger long-term reclamations coming up of some historical piles. So um, that's another spot where we talk about more soil testing, as, as somebody brought up. Those are the areas that we're going to focus more on, on testing. So.